If you could be paying less on your mortgage, you'd want to know, right? First Commerce Financial will look at your current mortgage statement at no cost and no obligation to see if they can provide you with a better option. And if you're in the market to purchase a home, they can also save you money as they provide some of the best rates without the junk fees associated with most mortgages. They've already helped over 225 Floridians save money this year. The options they have available are ready to help you with your mortgage or refinancing needs. Simply call 248-207-2404 or visit them online at firstcommercefinancial.com. Mention you heard it here first on Warchant. Welcome in to the Warchant.com report brought to you by First Commerce Financial. Great to be with you as always. The Knowles coming off the bye week set to take on ACC rival Clemson on the road 330 game to be televised on ABC. Obviously, the two programs have gone in very different directions the last few years, and that sees Florida State as a prohibitive underdog in this one. I guess you would start with the fact that through the last 30 games, Florida State is a mere 15 and 15. Two of those wins, very exciting victories over ULM. Uh, as for Clemson, they've won two of the last the three. Don't forget the Sam for Oh, I'm sorry. That was Sam riveting. As that well. was exciting. That yeah. was. Uh, and as it is for Clemson, they've won two of the last three national titles. Different directions, like I said. Uh, Gene, how did we get here? <laughs> wow, that's sobering. Um, well, I, I, let's go back to what FSU, after they had all that success 2013, 2014, they didn't build on it. Where you watch, see Clemson the last few years, they get successful, they recruit better, they, you know, they keep more stability, they build facilities, they do all this. And I think it really goes back to shortly after the, you know, 14, 15 seasons, Jimbo Fisher just started checking out. He was not the same coach. I know he had a lot of personal issues. We don't need to get into that. But obviously, he was not the same guy that was hungry and doing all the stuff he was doing 2011, 2012, building that program up. Wasn't the same at all. And you also got to go back. Part of that is the recruiting. When you go back, looking at the 2015 to the 17 classes, which should really make up the bulk of the team right now, at least the key players, rank number two, rank number three, rank number five. Sounds great, right, Jeff? Uh, Should be, does, yeah. but let's look. Let's look at quarterbacks. Who'd you recruit? Malik Henry, mm. uh, DeAndre. Start this weekend for Nevada. Oh, oh, big one in San Jose State. Yeah, it's a big, absolutely. big game. Yeah. Uh, DeAndre Johnson kicked off the team, and then DeAndre Francois, which is an okay quarterback. You know, recruiting not a great leader. But I mean, when you're c putting out all of these number one draft picks and you're winning national championships, how do you drop the ball at recruiting quarterbacks? Yeah, I don't get it. And same thing. You look at offensive line. You look at linebacker. Just horrible recruiting during those key years. Even though you had all the success, you didn't build all those. Yeah, you had a lot of five-star running backs and defensive backs, but very unbalanced classes. And I think we're seeing a lot of that right now at those positions where Florida State's really hurting. Yeah, and Corey, I'll, we'll get into what's realistic in terms of a timeline for them to get back to where they're elite again. But you mentioned offensive line. Uh, what a disaster. Obviously, for years, he was very loyal to a certain coach, and that coach could not bring in elite recruits on the offensive line. And when you can't win the line of scrimmage, I don't care how many talented players you have at wide receiver or running back or really any, yeah. any of the skill positions, you can't win games. And uh, Florida State hasn't had a good offensive line really since 2014 on. I mean, they were okay in 2015, but it's been a sore spot for a long time. And the rebuild starts there. What's a realistic timeline to potentially close the gap? And what's the quickest way to get there? Closing the gap overall with Clemson? I mean, cheating would be the best <laughs> best way. Uh, no, I mean, you've got, you've got to shore up the offensive line for sure. It's an embarrassment. What it's been for the last half decade has been an abject failure and an embarrassment. Um, you, can't, you can't be a, even a solid program and have one of the worst offensive lines in the country. And I think we all think it's a bit better this year, but it's still not very good mm -hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. You put Florida State on a field with a Georgia, Alabama, Clemson, Ohio Name State. them. Ohio State, LSU, Florida, well, maybe not Florida, but Oklahoma. Athlete for athlete at a lot of other positions, you're like, okay, that, that, looks, this, that looks similar, and they play similar. On an offensive line, it's like the JV and the varsity. They are just completely overmatched at that position, and you just hope guys, there's going to be more guys like Dante Lucas, who I think will be a very good player by the time he's a junior. He's already probably their best lineman. you got to get more guys like him up front. you got to. And on both lines of the both lines of scrimmage, really. Um, I'm, I'm curious what this program is going to look like next year without Marvin Wilson. Uh, I think obviously you would think you'd take a little bit of a step back on the defensive line, but I think the line of scrimmage is where you catch up. That's where you have to catch up. I think you can recruit. It's Florida, man. You're going you're to recruit the skill position guys. You're going to get guys that will come here and play in Willie Taggart's offense or Kendall Bryles' offense, and you're going to get defensive guys that can play in the back seven, you'd hope. But the line of scrimmage, you've got to do better at the line of scrimmage. Clemson is steady putting dudes in the league. Um, on that defensive line of scrimmage. 
I also think that recruits need a reason to choose you. And I think recruits have to believe that there's something moving in a positive direction at Florida State. And one of the key areas for Willie Taggart to win, and I'm talking about winning not just on Saturdays, but winning long-term at Florida State would be his recruiting prowess. And the only way you can take advantage of that skill set, which I think he is a very good recruiter, is to win enough games to give players a reason to choose you over another rival program or certainly any of these key programs we just mentioned in the South. Right now, they look at Florida and they see Dan Mullen and they see a program that's moving in the right direction, winning games. Dan's not a dynamic recruiter. They don't want to choose Dan Mullen. He's a goofball. But they're winning football games. Miami's not winning football games right now. Manny Diaz looks like he's in well over his head and it's comical to watch. There's still an opportunity for Florida State here to gain some ground if you could just win seven games, certainly eight games, and give kids a reason to say, you know, I think they've got something going there. But if you continually get pummeled like they are going to get pummeled on Saturday and lose games against marginal teams in a bad conference, you don't give anybody an opportunity to believe that there's something positive going on here. So the remainder of this schedule, not just this Clemson game, is critical for Willie Taggart to be able to utilize the skill set that I think he's uniquely gifted in, which is recruiting. Now, this Saturday, Florida State will use two quarterbacks. Willie Taggart announced that. James Blackman will start. Uh, You knew that was the direction they were going to go because Willie told you even a week ago, two weeks ago, that if James were healthy, he'd be the starter. He is, but they also want to play Alex Hornibrook. Uh, Guys, let's start with you, Corey. What do you think of the two-quarterback setup? You think that's ideal, and how do you think it'll play out on Saturday? I think it's bad news for Clemson, is what I think. <laughs> I, they don't know what they're not going to what to do. Uh, yeah, no, I, I like it um, because they are, you know, I, I obviously I think Blackman has a much more talented arm, but he spirals into madness sometimes. Where if he do, if it doesn't go well on one drive, it might be four straight drives where he can't do anything. So I like that they have another guy that can come in and be a relief pitcher for him. I, I do. I, I'm going to use that analogy probably all season. You have a starter that, that looks great for three innings. As soon as he starts getting shelled and gives up two hard-hit balls, go to your bullpen. And you can always bring him back if the bullpen struggles. But I, I think that's what Hornybrook gives you. I think those two games against NC State and Louisville showed those guys if they needed any confirmation. Okay, we can count on him to move the, move the ball. I, you know, Hornybrook, I think, looks like he runs the offense, maybe grasp it a little better as far as getting the ball out of his hands quicker. quicker. Yeah. But at the end of the day, he played a four quarters against a bad NC State team and put up 31 points, just what they've been doing with James Blackman, too. So I don't know that the, at the end of the day, there's really a lot of difference production wise between the two quarterbacks. It's just when Blackman gets in his rut, maybe Hornybrook comes in hot, and instead of scoring 31 points in these games, you score 41 points. Gene, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the system? I mean, I think normally when you have one quarterback, you got one leader everybody looks to. That obviously is shaken up a little bit when you don't have two guys, but I think this is a different scenario here. Some of the continuity, they both throw the ball a little differently, obviously hand off the ball differently, left, right, hander, all that kind of stuff. So there's some of that, but I think, to Corey's point, I agree that I think the advantages far outweigh those things because you've got two quarterbacks with different skill sets. We've seen James Blackman get hot as a firecracker to start out a bunch of games. If that follows a normal path and he gets in that fourth, fifth series and starts to cool off and you see it, you go, boom, bring in the relief pitcher, bring in a horny buck. And if he's struggling, you can go back to Blackman. So, I mean, it gives you so much flexibility from that position. And I think you got a couple guys that mentally, ego-wise can handle this. These aren't, I don't think they're big ego guys. You can tell the team likes both of them a lot. Couldn't have done this last year with Francois. I think that would have created problems. These two are good guys. They're leaders. They're personable. I think it will work very well in the system. Now, the opponent's a different matter, but I think this is a really good approach to enter this game with. Can I say something real quick? You, you wouldn't do this if either one of these guys were special or great. They're sure. not. No. They're just There's decent ceiling, college quarterbacks. Yeah. So if you, have, if you have, you know, the saying, if you have two quarterbacks, you have yeah, none. Yeah, yeah. But you have two decent college quarterbacks. Yeah. Why, why anchor yourself to one of them? See if the other one might be hot yeah. that day. And I also think that, to Gene's point, they like each other. Sure. You know, yeah, it's not just that they, they're kind of egoless. They root for each other, and you can see this. And the team seems to like both guys an awful lot, too. We already knew they liked James Blackman. I think the surprise has been how quickly they've uh, uh, grown affectionate for Alex Hornibrook and his work yeah. ethic and what he's been able to do. So that's, that's a good thing as well. When we come back, Gene just said it. It's a different animal, the opponent, that is. Clemson 5-0, and not exactly playing like the Clemson of a year ago. But then again, coming off a bye week and a wake-up call against North Carolina could change that. We'll see. We'll talk about them next on the Warchant.com report. Did you hear that? That is the sound of Florida State football. Be ready, Knowles. You bleed it, now own it. Check out Tallahassee's number one store for FSU gear, Garnet and Gold. 
Locally owned for over 40 years, turn to their team to bring you the finest selection of spirited apparel and merchandise for every fan. They're always happy to see you and always happy to serve you. Visit their flagship store at 1504 Governor Square Boulevard, the campus shop over on West Pensacola, or if you're on the north side of town at 1400 Village Square Boulevard, and always on the web at garnetandgold.com. Garnet and Gold, a Tallahassee tradition you can depend on. If you're a Seminole, they're your store. Go Knowles! Welcome back to the Warchant.com report. Of course, Florida State taking on Clemson 3.30 on ABC. Go to the Warchant.com game day page for all the game watching locations throughout the United States. And we'd like to thank our sponsor, First Commerce Financial, as always. And so we look at Clemson, they come in at 5-0. Uh, you really thought coming into this season absolutely loaded with a Heisman candidate at quarterback and Trevor Lawrence. Uh, obviously, ATN at running back is ex is as explosive as any running back in the country. Uh, T. Higgins, a stud, Justin Ross, you could go on down the list. It's interesting with this team, though, they haven't played up to the talent that they have. Number eight overall in S&P Plus ratings behind Alabama, Ohio State, Oklahoma, LSU, Georgia, Penn State, Wisconsin. Mm. They haven't played great despite that talent. They've been inconsistent on offense. They're 15th rated overall on offense in S&P, 10th overall on defense. Now, last year, heading into week seven, guys, they were sixth in S&P+. No one stayed within 20 points of them the rest of the season. So yeah. they were a different looking mm. team uh, as they came into it last year. Uh, obviously, you look at this team, they've just kind of looked bored at times. I'll start with Eugene. Uh, Clemson's offense, like I said, didn't look potent against North Carolina. They were average against Texas A&M. They kind of seized control in the second quarter, but really kind of looked okay there. Any chance that perhaps Forest State can muster something here against this team who's been sort of, I don't know, bored? You wonder if this is kind of reminiscent of Florida State 2014 where they, they won the national championship. Maybe some of that hunger, some of that focus is kind of fading a little bit on that side of the ball because they, they haven't been quite the same offensively. You don't see that explosive, which is crazy when you mention all the guys you mentioned, Jeff, are going to be playing in the league. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're all, they're all special players, especially that quarterback, and that's the biggest thing to me. If you look into his stats, five last year, yeah, he's got eight touchdowns and five picks through five games. Last year he threw four. All season, I know he didn't start every game last season, but I mean, it's unbelievable night and day. I was curious, I looked up the pro football focus grades, and he was over 90% passing grade last year. This year, 67.6. Hornybrook has a higher passing grade right now than he does. Now, I don't think that'll I take play out. They should trade. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, yeah. trade right now. <laughs> I don't think that'll play out across the board, but this has not been the same Trevor Lawrence that we saw last year. Now, you know he's got the, the arm talent is through the roof, one of the best I've ever seen at the college level. So I think they're still very good. They're very potent. Don't get thrown off by that. But there's definitely a little something missing to this offense this year. So that we'll see, was that a wake-up call against North Carolina, or is this team really just maybe off a little bit from last year? What must Florida State's defense do, Corey, uh, if there's one thing that you would choose uh, in order to give themselves a fighting chance to to win the game. I mean, I want to say pressure Lawrence, but I don't, I don't think they're going to do that unless they blitz. Uh, stopping the running game, I think, is something that's actually uh, feasible, that they can do, because they've actually been good at it. Willie Taggart said a couple weeks ago that we wanted to be, we wanted to at least try one thing we, we, we felt we were good at, because last year they weren't good at anything. And he thinks this year now they're good at stopping the run. They've become a, a pretty stout run defense when the, when the starters are on the field. When you throw the backups in, it gets Not a little dicey. Yeah. But when the starters are on the field, they're really tough to block. Those are three guys with Cooper, Durden, and Marvin Wilson that are very good. And I don't think – if you can at least get them in second and eights, in third and eights, you got a fighting chance maybe that he misses some throws. If it's always second and two or if they're running for six, seven, eight yards of carry with that kid, you got no shot. If you're giving up running, at least make them – try to make them one-dimensional and then take your chances that your cornerbacks will, you know – We'll, we'll cover my receivers. Cover somebody, Smiley, yeah. 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 Cover somebody yeah. yeah. That would be something. It's, it's an area. Yeah, you can't have ATN running the football. You know, it's interesting. Clemson has kind of lost sight at times of ATN. They just forget about yeah. him, um, and they've become pass happy. And the other thing they haven't done is really challenge the middle of the football field. Right. We'll see if they do that this weekend or not. I mean, they've, everything's been outside the hash. Now, they got elite studs out there, and I get it. You're tempted to go to them all the time because they make spectacular catches. But if you can make them one-dimensional and they become predictable in that way, you would think that these corners at some point would begin to make some plays. And Florida State has has won the turnover battle uh, almost yeah. every week this year. So maybe you can kind of hold your breath and hope that happens again. Clemson's defense is really good. We thought they would drop off with all those defensive linemen going to the league. The truth is that's the one area they have been able to hang their hat on. They're top 10 in S&P+. You look at them, they're 
you know, going, con, going to be consistently good, I think, for as long as Brent Venables is there. And uh, it's, the, it's the main concern that I have. Um, which players would you be most concerned about if you're looking at Clemson defensively? Really all of them. I mean, <laughs> legitimately, like Isaiah Simmons is yeah, a really, really good, good player. player. Uh, Kayvon Wallace is very good. The corner, A.J. Terrell, there. they've got players at all, every level. But it's just baffling. It's not baffling. It's what Florida State used to be. Mm-hmm. They would lose Peter Bulwer and Renard Wilson, sure and not. you'd be like, how are they going to replace those guys? Oh, there's Andre Wadsworth. Yep. And there's a Greg Spires that's a backup. I mean, they just reload. And I know it's a cliche, but holy moly, they lost essentially a top two round defensive line. They lost all four defensive linemen. Yeah. All were, what, picked in the top two rounds? top 60 players in the country, and then they come out and their defense is putting up just as good of numbers this year. That doesn't make sense. It's well, not been fair. A, they, it's one not of the things fair, too, man. <laughs> You're supposed to take a step back. <laughs> That's what people used to say about us. But, but, but you know, the truth is they were also able to continue to foster growth in those other right. guys that were behind the starter set because inexplicably all of the first-round draft picks back. decided to come back yeah. for another year. Yeah. So you were able to get those guys bigger It's the stronger. slide, Jeff. They love the slide. Yeah, they don't uh, want to leave that. Uh, I do know this. They have fostered it, uh, you know, and engendered this attitude there at Clemson where those guys know they're having the time of their life and they want to stay. Yeah. I mean, they've really done a good job with that. Gene, let's uh, continue to look at, uh, you know, what Clemson's defense is. What will FSU need to do offensively against this defense to have a chance? Now, of course, easier said than done and kind of the opposite of what Corey said, and that is be able to run the football. I mean, last year, if you go back and look at those stats, I know the sacks are building, but negative 21 yards rushing, that won't get the ball done. So I think what you got to do is look at the North Carolina formula. Believe it or not, North Carolina did have some success running the football. They were very balanced in their offense. They ran for about 150 yards against Clemson. That's not lights out, but it makes them respect that you can't be, like you said, as good as that defense is, if you're one dimensional against them trying to throw the ball around, you're gonna get you're gonna get sacked, you're gonna create you're gonna have turnovers. You can't do that. In this game, North Carolina ran the ball fairly effectively. They didn't have a single turnover and they only had three total penalties. So you have to play a very close to best, nearly perfect game on that. And if you're able to do that, maybe you can the defense plays well enough stops to run, you can keep the game close like North Carolina. And I'll take a two point try to win the game at the end if, if it comes down to that. So that's what I think you need to do. Imagine if it came down to Florida State. How uh, would Willie really go win. for it? Uh, I hope. Well, maybe uh, better. I would. Yeah, and, I think and, you have and moreover, to. I think uh, regardless in that situation, maybe momentarily you'd be disappointed if it ended the way that Carolinas did. But at the same time, yeah. you'd be thinking of how much further this team has come from a year ago. They maybe. should go back to that play they ran at the end of the Virginia game. Love that play. Yeah. Love that no play. way. It we're done we're, we're sort of half the team. They'll never the expect it. The other half doesn't. And that's hard know. to defend when yeah, the guy you're done. covering doesn't that know what he's doing. That guy doesn't seem to know, oh, what is this guy doing? Uh, they don't seem to be in sync here. You know, one of, one of the problems, though, and I think the great quandary here as we move forward and talk about the keys to victory, is that for Florida State, you can't shorten the game. You know, you referenced before, but if, if this were a Jimbo Fisher team, he would shorten the game and lessen possessions. That's not how this offense succeeds. They can't allow opposing defenses to get set up because when that happens, the four state offensive line gets destroyed. They have to mitigate that weakness by playing tempo, which means more possessions, which means your defense is going to be on the field facing Trevor Lawrence in that offense more times than not. I just don't know that you can do that, but I don't think you can't do it. Like, they don't know another way to play. You have to play fast to offset your weakness on the offensive line. Uh, Keys to victory, uh, guys, I mean, I think we kind of laid out some of them there. Don't turn it over. Don't commit a lot of penalties. Try to stay balanced if you can. Anything you want to add to that? Well, again, looking at the North Carolina game, they did not give up big plays at all. They didn't give up one play over 40, only three plays between 20 and 39 yards they gave up in that game. So they made Clemson, maybe Trevor Lawrence earn that and move the ball down the field. So, I mean, again, I think you have to do that because last year, after that first quarter against Clemson, as we saw, it was just an air raid. It was bombs all over the place and crazy yeah. long gains. That can't happen, obviously. So, I mean, limit them, make them earn it on offense. I'd say the, the one thing that Florida State's defense has done pretty well this year is limit the big plays. Now, they've limited a lot they've of first downs. made it nearly impossible for big plays because they, because they play off by 20 like yards. Like, I think the one big play they allowed was the, the touchdown. Was it Louisville that threw the long touchdown where Asante's right yeah, there yeah, and yeah. just misses that? It's a 75-yard mm-hmm. yeah. TD. Um, so, I yeah. He that even. Yeah. yeah, he did. So, just do that, I guess. And, and you, you know, you got to get lucky. You've got to get some breaks. If he throws you a pass, DBs, gotta you can't it. look like a seal clapping. <laughs> like, you got to catch a ball. You, you have to. You're, you're playing a real good team. He's not going to do it a lot. And you just, yeah, you just hope you get lucky. I think the problem, like you said, though, the way you're trying to find a way to win this game is like, 
okay, yeah, the only way the offense is going to move the ball is to, to go fast. quick. Well, that, then by the third or fourth quarter, even if it's a close game, your defense will be exhausted. It's and it's bust. against Clemson's offense. It's yeah, you could lose by 50 to, doing yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, you have to win a game 55, 52, something crazy, uh, and, and hope like heck that works for you. Because, But the problem is we all know sitting at this table, if you do that and you fail, say, in back-to-back possessions, the way this team sometimes does, it really as it always does, at least at some point in the game, sure. you really are set up to get blown out. Mm-hmm. You don't want more possessions for Clemson, but I don't think that you can play it any other way because they don't know how to play slow. When we come back, we'll talk about it, potential for a quality loss. Is that what we say here? I mean, what would that look like? <laughs> sure. Perhaps throw that out there. Not exactly a uh, hope-filled segment, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that, and then we'll also go through our picks where I was tremendous last week. Uh, it's next on the Warchant.com report. Make it simple, Seminole fans. Subscribe to the WarChant.com YouTube channel for instant access to unbeatable analysis. We're talking 50 years of combined experience covering Florida State athletics, unmatched digital storytelling, including exclusive access with the recruits you need to know, and your daily dose of all things garnet and gold with Wake Up WarChant. That's only the tip of the spear. The WarChant.com message boards continue to be the most active and passionate community of Seminole fans anywhere and feature insider information you won't find anywhere else. Use the promo code WARCHANT30 for a free 30-day trial to see why WARCHANT.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. The WARCHANT.com report is brought to you by First Commerce Financial. If you're looking to purchase or refinance a home and want to secure the best possible rate, all while saving money without sacrificing service, give First Commerce Financial a call at 248-207-2404 or visit FirstCommerceFinancial.com. Mention you heard it here first on Warchant.com. Welcome back to the Warchant.com report. Time for us to get into uh, talk about a quality loss or maybe a shocking upset. All brought to you by our friends at First Commerce Financial. Here we go. All right. Florida State is more than a three-touchdown underdog, almost a four-touchdown underdog here. I just don't think they got a chance to, hell to upset Clemson. It makes me laugh to have to talk about that. Uh, staying competitive, though. On the heels of back-to-back victories, uh, panel, uh, what would you need to see here to continue to feel like this thing's moving forward and, and good about yourself on Saturday evening as this thing winds down? Uh, you're not going to upset them. I mean, I think we all agree on that one. It's just it's very unrealistic. But, I mean, you wanna, you've got a little bit of momentum right now. You can see it kind of in the players' attitudes. You can see it Willie Taggart in the press conference. You know, I asked him about recruiting. He's, he, could, he admitted he saw a little uptick, a little bit more, you know, energy out there in the recruiting trail with kids. And we talked about that, getting that program to mm. close that gap. And I think what you don't want to do is lose that momentum. So that doesn't, you don't have to win this, upset this to keep momentum. If you stay competitive with them for three, maybe three and a half quarters in this game, make them sweat a little bit, make the game exciting. I think that can carry over to the next week, which is really more, at the end of the day, let's face it, that's a more important game, the Wake Forest game, to continue this momentum. What you don't want to do is have a repeat of last year. Let's not see that again, because I think that could upset them so badly emotionally. It could resonate for a couple more weeks. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Uh, you know, last year they lost 59-10, to 10, and then the next week, to Clemson, the next week they didn't even, I mean, that, that NC State game was an embarrassment. So was the Notre Dame game. Notre Dame game was just, even worse, those, yeah. but they just, they were like, okay, we must be terrible, and they played like it for uh, eight straight quarters. It was just an embarrassment for the, what that Florida State defense did, those two, though, and the offense, for that matter, those two games. So uh, other than Blackman and Terry, they did well against NC State. You remember that. Uh, we James all remember Blackman that. threw it around a lot. But we... um, so, yeah, but I do think, um, as we talked about earlier on, on Seminole, headlines we do think that this team might be more apt to recover from a bad yeah, loss I think they're mentally tougher because of how they responded to the Louisiana Monroe win that was that was as bad as Clemson in my opinion that game was more embarrassing or as embarrassing as the 59 to 10 loss last year and instead of tucking their tails between their legs and letting that derail the season they went and played their best game to date and should have probably beaten beaten Virginia who's a pretty yeah. good team on the road yeah. so they responded to that well so I do think even if it goes poorly against Clemson on Saturday, which it probably will, you, 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 they still have shown the ability to bounce back. Well, it's and, important and, for the growth of the program. You need to yeah, see that they believe in their coaching staff. Last year, I don't think they did. And it was evidenced by those eight quarters that Corey is referencing. Here, if you go out and lose, I don't, I don't throw around a score. We'll do a score prediction in a second. But you fight hard, you play hard, and it doesn't work out for you. If you go on the road and beat Wake Forest and you're back to 500, you know, listen, this is a sign of real growth and buy-in. Players saying, yes, I believe we're moving somewhere positive and I'm going to continue to fight uh, like hell to make something good happen about this season and go to a bowl game. And then 
capitalize in recruiting in the yep. offseason. That's really the key here. All right, let's get to some picks. It's time, boys. Last week, I believe I was the only one with a winning record at 4-2. and two. I, Ira, was, I abstained. I wasn't here, you obviously. Here. I, if you want to know my predictions, I, w- I would have been 5-1 and one last week. Okay, I'd like yeah, to know that. Okay, I'll write that in. Yeah. Uh, Ira was 2-4, and four, oh. typically terrible. He was terrible again. <laughs> Gene was 500 where he lives. Uh, right there in uh, Middleville, he likes to just kind of be average. But here we Thank go you. as we get to the picks. Let's start with, <laughs> what a game, Virginia at Miami. I laugh at this Friday night game, fun game to watch. Miami outgained Virginia Tech by 40% per play and lost the football game. That's what happens with turnovers, boys. Can't mm-hmm. turn the football over excessively. It was a joy to watch them lose yet again. But you know what? Particularly heartbreaking, too, after the comeback. Yeah, after the comeback and so everything. Just, and then, then yeah, you missed the extra point. Missed the extra point, and then Virginia Tech goes yeah. down. Uh, it was a joy to watch. I'll take Miami and give the point to half really? to Virginia. I don't think the Virginia team is very good. Florida State should have won that football game. I think Miami bounces back and gets a win at home. Virginia does one thing. At least they're steady. They're well coached. Mm-hmm. Miami's horribly coached. Um, I think the state of Virginia owns the Canes. So I'll, Virginia all the way. Anytime Virginia team, even give me Virginia Commonwealth, will beat Miami right well, now. Well, we're all forever grateful to Virginia, I believe, when they closed down the Orange Bowl 47 yes. to nothing. That's <laughs> right. I forgot about that. that. Might have been, that it was a great memory. With all of the <laughs> alumni there, they got to watch the Canes get beat, boat raced. Yeah. It was yeah. over by halftime. It was glorious. I, w- I think I'm going to take Virginia. Okay. I like Virginia. I like them to win by... Uh, I'm the lone wolf. Looks like I'll be 1-0. These cats will be 0-1. Here we go. Woo. Oklahoma's Woo. at Texas. Oh, it's actually Red River. So it is uh, a fun rivalry game every year. Ten and a half is too rich for my blood. Wait, you know, who's I look- favored by ten and a half? Oklahoma. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, rightfully, of course. Okay, right. Uh, what I would say here is that, uh, you know, I look back on Texas's loss to LSU, and right about now, that looks like yeah. a mighty good loss. They played well in that game. They were within a touchdown down late uh, and for that reason I'll take Oklahoma to win the game but not cover the ten and a half the hook scares me yeah they play uh, they play Oklahoma tough and this is one of the few matchups Oklahoma has been blowing people out but talent wise this is one of the teams can match up with them talent wise and I think that creates more of a problem for Oklahoma so I'm with you Jeff don't like the hook I think Oklahoma wins but that's too many points uh, yeah I'm gonna take Texas uh, I think Texas probably wins the game outright Ooh. I'll be honest with you Ooh. I think Jalen Hurts he's never played in a big game before <laughs> this is gonna be he's gonna be skittish being in a rivalry game like yeah. this no really I still I Lee and Riley is unbelievable. He is an unbelievable offensive mind. He's made that kid look like a legitimate a throwing yeah. passing quarterback. Mm-hmm. But he's played just awful defenses. Texas at least has some dudes that can run around and make plays and put pressure on them. So I don't think he'll be as good. And I just think Texas uh, will score more than Oklahoma. How about that? How about that analysis? I think you're wrong, but I like that you went out on a limb there and took the 10.5 point underdog. Um, Yeah, and to your point about Lincoln Riley, he made Baker Mayfield look good. All right, Michigan State's at Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin is giving 10. Uh, I hate this game. Uh, It's classic Big Ten nonsense that you don't want to watch, that's almost impossible to watch. Uh, Michigan State will struggle to score three points. if I, I, I'll take Wisconsin minus 10. I hate the game. Yeah, I do too. This is the last. If I were to pick one, I would never pick this one. No, it's I mean, not on the I don't, card, I don't get it at all. <laughs> um, Wisconsin, has, Michigan State's got the good defense, but Wisconsin's look really good. That running game has been unbelievable this year. So, I mean, they just look so good. It's at Wisconsin. A lot of beer and cheese flowing. Go ahead and give me them. Yeah, I like Wisconsin. I don't think Michigan State's going to score 10 points. I don't either. That's, that's what makes it tough. Alabama. Do they ever, when, do they ever have it? Since Andre Risen, have they had an <laughs> offense? It's crazy. It's been a while. Uh, Alabama's at Texas A&M. Uh, when this number originally came out, I saw 18 and a half, and I jumped on it for A&M because Jimbo will shorten the game. Jimbo will try to get out of there with his dignity. He'll lose the game by like 17. I, I'll take Texas A&M to keep this relatively close. Once Alabama gets a big lead, they're going to run the ball into the line and run the clock and get out of there with a win. So I'll take Texas A&M. Well, here's where I gain one on you, Jeff, because I'm mm. going against Jimbo on this one. That's just not enough points against Alabama. They're rolling right now. Okay. Yeah, I got to take. I, I'm taking A&M. That's a lot of points That's at just home. Too many points. That's a lot of points right. at home. They're a decent team. One. They're not a terrible right. team. Here, a here's team. another game with too many points. I like Ooh. Florida's defense. Uh, I do. Now, is that a night game? I didn't. That is a night game. Road and Baton Rouge. That kind of where. Apparently, it's an right. ABC game, too. All right, give me LSU minus the 13 and a half. At home, at night, Florida coming off an emotional win against Auburn at home. Uh, it's a physical game. I'll take LSU to throw it around the lot a little bit and uh, cover the 13 and a half. Ordinarily, I wouldn't do that, but 13 and a half, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm with you. I think Florida is a bit fraudulent. They're they're well coached. They don't make mistakes, but they're not a great team. They play the worst quarterback I may have ever seen. But well, Bill was uh, a true freshman. Let's well, go. Well, I know he yeah, may be good in a couple he, years. He, he was awful yeah. against Florida. They just he had was. He if was. they had a Hornybrook, they would have won by two touchdowns. If they'd have had my son, they would have won by a touchdown. <laughs> well, I mean, that kid was and terrible. And Gus Malzahn's play calling. What oh. are we doing here, my man? Everything was east west. Yeah. You know, outside of the one shot down the field, can we get something where there's complimentary routes? What are you doing, Gus? I like. Uh, I do like Florida. Florida always plays LSU close. Tough. There, especially yeah. there, like they either win or it's down to the final few minutes. Even when LSU is awesome, yeah. uh, well, I, and that thirteen and a half is a lot. Game. It's a lot, and that kid's playing well at quarterback. It's that night, man. It's fine. They always party, party night. night. It's fine. Night. It's fine. Yeah. That, kid, that kid's playing a lot well, of drunk well enough man, at quarterback. Place is going to be rocking. All right, FSU and Clemson. We were just stutter effing our way through all that to try to avoid this game. We did not want to pick this game. That number is huge. 26 for Clemson. Uh, let's first, let's just give out our final scores. That'll tell everybody whether they think they're covering or not. What you got? Uh, you guys are talking me out of my, I'm going to have them covered. I'm going to say 45-27 Clemson. They cover the spread pretty easily there. All right, I got 48-24. I got them covering too. I had 44-17. Right there at the, depending on what number you get, have you're you, right there. Have you seen a Kendall Browse offense? Yeah. When was the last time they only scored 17 points? I mean, I'm, this, it doesn't happen. Okay, Corey hey, hey, what's the last time you played at Clemson? Death Valley. What are you doing? Death Valley. Chucking it around the lot on Saturday, baby. Horty Black's going to be there throwing dimes everywhere. All right, <laughs> he he's, was just waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So you say no on the cover. Corey and I, yep. I mean, uh, Gene and I say yes. I mean, I was right there. It's twenty. I said they're going to lose by 27. They're right there. From the there. Cheap, 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 cheap seats. I can't speak at the end of the show. Who you got? Uh, I'll cover. All right, there we go. There, there you go. There you go. I feel good. You're gonna win that. outright. Yeah. I'm gonna boot. I'm gonna do an IRA Boom. from last oh, year. Uh, Celebration. They're, they're winning outright. I see an upset Save coming. Save the clip. Save the clip because you can always doctor it to like <laughs> the series. Sure. Uh, for Corey and Gene and Aslan, I'm Jeff. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. We'll talk to you next time on the WarChant.com report.